She was like a minute walk away. And I thought, oh, well, that's cool. And um, he said, if you want to come round to discuss it, please feel free to. So I went round and, um, you know, hit it off with Dave quite straight away, really. I mean, he, to this day, he does all of our album covers. He's done like eight for us, you know. He's done every album sleeve we've ever, for every record we've recorded. Um, and I think he's a very important part of what we do, really. Um, and uh, he, he, like me, is very much like against anything to do with the church and religion. He's very much despises religion in many respects, and he's a very intelligent guy. And um, literally, we yeah sat down and had a few cups of coffee, went for these ideas. And about three days later, he came back knocking on my door, and he had like a, I've actually got it with me. He did a pencil drawing of the album cover. And it totally blew my mind. I was like, wow, this is it, it's perfect. Well, I've got the original painting at home, but obviously it's a bit heavy to bring down, so. Oops, I need to be careful with these, really hard. I had, a, I had a vision in my mind of like there being a central figure. And I had a very, very good idea, which Lee thought of, that we'd have a dark side and a light side. And uh, in the dark side, there would be danger and it would be a little bit seedy and uh, very dangerous. You, you wouldn't, you'd have to be very strong in order to feel as if you could walk on this side without, without getting molested in some horrible way. And on the light side, uh, everything is uh, safe. And maybe there's an element of pretense, but uh, people are at least uh, are very polite and it's uh, anybody can stroll through the light side and uh, they never be, and you can organize your life to be on the light side if you want to and uh, never take a risk and just go along with uh, what the people around you advise you to do etc mm. and um, Lee wanted someone who could walk on the dark side on the light side, like a hero figure that is asexual and either man or woman so that uh, they can walk on both sides of sexuality as well as on the dark and on the light so we have a hero figure, neither man nor woman, and this figure is equally at home and looks equally confident and uh, is strolling through the dark side as if it was the light side. And vice versa, going through the light side like it's yeah. the dark, like stressed out. So it's all about balance and stuff. And in a nutshell, it's about living life without religion and finding you know, a balance in, in life between like positives and negatives and yeah. light and dark. Find the strength in yourself. Yeah, that's essentially what it's about really. It's kind of a nice mm. anarchist idea. The first gig was at a place called The Stoker, which is no longer there. It's down the road from here. And that was with SOB, who were like a Japanese hardcore punk band who were on my label. Um, and then... Yeah. We played at the barrel organ, didn't we? We did the barrel organ. Yeah, yeah, that was funny because I remember the. Oh yeah, I remember, I remember the gig at the barrel organ and the, the guys from Barney, Barney was Nick there. and Barney from yeah. Napalm were there. And I remember we finished the set and it went quiet <laughs> and there was this oh, no siege in there. <laughs> 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 it was either Mick or Barney. Someone said no siege in there. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Yeah, you, well, you're fucking absolutely right there. Because there was no siege in there. But um, And then they went away to Europe and came back. And that was the time when we played with St. Vitus for the first yeah. time in, at the Dome in Tufnell Park. Yeah, Agnostic Front. Yeah. Agnostic Front. Yeah. 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 It was Agnostic Front, St. Vitus, Cathedral SOB, and I can't remember who else. Mm. And then we did those like five or six dates in the UK with St. Vitus. Vitus. Which was kind of fantastic, but weird. It's, it's like beating beat. your idols, wasn't it? Yeah. But I remember we met Wino, he, he introduced himself, and he's like, Hi, I'm Wino. I was like, Yeah, I know. So, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think that phased him out of it. But. And then with the first tour outside of England we did was with uh, Paradise Lost. We used to get uh, people in the crowd shout, well, the, cr the crowd, Faster. the 10. Yeah. Faster. Yeah. Faster. Yeah. Yeah. Faster. Yeah. Yeah. The first major one we did was probably the Gods of Grind tour the, after the Soul Sacrifice EP. <laughs> And that's when... Well, that was enjoyable, that. That was a good crack. That was. Yeah. The first couple of tours we did, the one in America was good as well. I always remember the Gods of Grind tour because I was carrying the guitar around in one of our sleeping bags. 
one of mine. Because I didn't have a case for you. It was that weird shaped black oh, one, yeah. and I couldn't find any cases that would fit it, so I had to like, carry your green sleeping bag around with a guitar. And yes. and Where is it now? What, Mike? My, my, my sleeping bag. sleeping <laughs> bag. <laughs> 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 I think the guys of Grime one was, we were getting really wrecked in those days. We were drinking a hell of a lot, smoking loads of pot. Yeah, we were. <laughs> Don't, not, no way do I go to that excess anymore, but in those early days, we were getting pretty gained. The other bands on the tour were quite scared of us, I think. <laughs> after 10 days of free beer, you start to lose your mind, really, but after that stage. The only thing we were doing different in our live performances was, in the early days was the fact that we didn't have enough songs. <laughs> so, so what we used to do, we, there's, a, there's a, a female artist called Diamond Aguilar, and uh, we used to play one of her tracks off the Litanies of Satan album as an intro, and we'd come on stage and just stand there for like, <laughs> for like 15 minutes with her screaming her head off, and just stand there like looking at the floor. <laughs> Do you always remember the voice in the crowd that was, fuck the intro, fuck the intro, Eugene, not Holland or something. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to hide by the back of the amps <laughs> quite a lot. I think it was just like, put your head down and just play Doom. It was important to us to do it that, that, that pace really, I think. Um, because, like I say, we weren't the most blessed musicians. Um, so we were kind of semi-limited in what we could do. We, like Adam was saying before, we could, we could never have played like Trouble played on their first album. We, 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 could, we weren't capable of doing that kind of stuff. So we just went with what our abilities were. And, uh, well, it was kind of weird, because obviously coming out of the bands that we come out of, like, um, I suppose Acid Rain was, some of it was semi-technical. So to come out of playing fast and having like 20 riffs as opposed to what Cathedral was doing was like four or five in a song was kind of strange. But we just, I just, you know, we just, the slowness was, was just vitally important to us to, to be as, I don't think we were like looking to be unique. We just ended up, I'm not saying we are unique, we just ended up being that way because it was just important that we were just slow. We, and it wasn't pre sort of like, yeah, because Lee was in Napalm and he's like, He's hyper fast, we're gonna go like hyper slow, you know, to sudden like be slow and everything. No, it? it was not planned no, like that. Right. It was it wasn't like that at all. People mm, yeah. seem to think, to think it was like that. Seem to think of but it was nothing. What they don't realise is the natural evolution with us individually. Of course. Shit, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because obviously we just all into slow music, it it just we just wanted to be in a band that played slow stuff. And, uh, I think there's something uniquely powerful about slow stuff. Of course, yeah. It's quite a magical uh, sound. There's something about it, it, there's so much space for expression when you play slow. Totally. And there's something, it, it, because it's not like a normal tempo, because it's not like uh, rotation of wheels and it's not like, it's kind of wrong. It's kind of wrong the way slow music is really. It's Live TV folks. <laughs> The fact that it's kind of not right, <coughs> it's not played in some kind of natural way, in the natural tempo, it's kind of forced deliberately to be a different tempo than what is considered to be, uh, I don't know what the word is, just conventional or whatever. There's something about it that fucks it. <laughs> <laughs> Who's, what's that say? Dad. <laughs> <laughs> And then when we did the first demo, the, the, the songs on there were like 10 minutes long and like they, they, the band would do like 
We've been, to like, we've been to about eight minutes. Eight minutes in, it's like, no, go, stop, yeah, slow it, down. slow it. The, slow voice, it. <laughs> the voice from the control room. Yeah. <laughs> Too fast. Too fast. <laughs> you sped up. Oh, no, nightmare. Nightmare. The sound, the kind of sound that we had, um, there was a glut of bands that were similar sounds after what we'd done a couple of years later, or maybe in a year later or something like that. So there wasn't really anything, any band sounded like us until obviously we came about and then there sort of a few bands afterwards. So I think we did have a, a, a quite a widespread influence on a lot of uh, the type of slower bands that, you know, afterwards. So I, I do think we've, uh, you know, influenced quite a I mean, the thing is, when, when, when we started doing it, we weren't at all pretending to think we're any, in any way original. Mm. And I think what we, what we did, we were like paying tribute to the bands that we were, really were into, you know? And like every interview, we'd always mention The Obsessed, St. Bias, Trouble, Candle Mass. We'd always mention these groups that had influenced us because we were almost doing it as a, as a fandom thing. We were just like, you know, this is our little tribute to those groups, really. We didn't consider that it would, it would have carried on. Mm. And, um, you know, when we, what, like, playing with St. Vitus and stuff like that, and then meeting Wino, and then meeting, what well, I eventually met Bobby Liebling and people like that, and then t doing gigs with Trouble. I mean, these are bands you kind of thought you're never ever going to see, let alone actually meet the guys and, and be kind of friends with them and stuff, so. To us, that was what it was all about in the first place. It was out of a love of the music, really, nothing else whatsoever. We didn't think we were doing anything original at all, really. In fact, I think we thought we were probably quite shit. <laughs> in some respects, at first, because we weren't as good musicians and we weren't as good as those bands that were our, our heroes, in a way. Basically, when we did the demo, um, I sent one to Earache, I sent one to Roadrunner, and I sent one to somebody else, so it might have been Century Media or something like that, I can't remember who else it was. It might have been Peaceful, I can't remember. I know Amy was really into us from Peaceful, and he wanted to sign us. And it was only when, I mean, you know, Roadrunner didn't get back to me until probably about six months after that, when I, I think things were happening in America. I think people, in the industry had caught wind about Cathedral and there was a buzz about us or something like this before we'd done an album. And um, It was Kevin Sharp as well, wasn't it? Kevin Sharp did the CMJ piece and, um, and that got a lot of people interested. And it was only, it, it's only when that happened that Roadrunner started getting back and, but then, then they started phoning me every day and then my phone got cut off. And I used to have to go to the library and send them a fax saying this is the Pay, this is the phone box I'm going to be in in five minutes' time, so give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> give me a call from New York and welcome back. I'll be there in the library <laughs> answering your call. It was that bad. But, um, and basically, but Dig at Earache was the one that went totally over the top about the band. He, thought, he said it was the most radical thing he'd heard in a few years or whatever. He just, I don't know if that was him just saying that. He just said he really liked it and everyone in the office liked it. And they'd love to work with us. You know, I, I think it, it just it was the best option for us at the time. They were enthusiastic about us. They were, the direction more so than anybody else. And, and um, it, in a way, it's better the devil you know in, in many respects. And um, I think he were pretty good to Cathedral as it goes. <laughs> After that, obviously we, uh, there was the five of us, with obviously the four Ian and Ben, our drummer, but uh, just prior to actually going into doing the album, <coughs> Ben, he kind of quit and uh, so we got, uh, we um, didn't really know what to do about drummer, but there was a guy that we liked who lived in America, a bit of a long shot, but this guy called Mike Smell, who was in a band called Dream Death. Mike had reformed Dream Death in, under a new name called Penance, yeah. and they were one of the bands, the demo came out, and it was great, fucking hell, this band are back, and it's, it sounds really good, and we liked his style of drumming, and we couldn't think of anyone in England, and we wanted someone who knew what Doom was about, really, mm. and he obviously did. And, um, so he flew him over to rehearse with us and asked him if he'd do it, and he said, yeah. And he's from Pittsburgh, Pitts by the way. Yeah, came over to rehearse for about two or three weeks and then went and recorded the album. 
in, well, I can't remember what month it was now, June, was it 91 or something? So that's basically what happened there, was Mike on the drums and stuff. And then, well, me and Gaz came back to Coventry, the electricity was cut off in the flat. <laughs> There's no food, fuck all. It was free. <laughs> fucking freezing cold. No lights or anything. And a battery. Uh, we had a, yeah, we had a tape player. And the batteries, in it. And the batteries were dead. So we were listening to the tape of the album on the fucking long speed. <laughs> <laughs> we were coming back from the studio, really excited to hear it on the ghetto blaster, but there's, the batteries were dead. There was no electricity. <laughs> Does it sound good, though? It sounded bad. Sounded bad. <laughs> Especially the uh, monks at the end. The monks, so Um, I don't think we got. A, we don't think we got a bad review, did we? Mm. I think yeah. we were really surprised. I, th I think it was taken very well at the time. Um, if I remember I, rightly, it went straight to the top of the indie chart, didn't it? It did, yeah. There's always oh. Walter Trout band just holding us off. <laughs> <laughs> In what magazine was that? It's a uh, real uh, band, wasn't it? pub rock band. What band was it? I don't remember. <laughs> <Really>? <laughs> Fanzine or something. What are you on about? <laughs> was it the Walter Trout band, really? Walter Trout band, yeah. Uh, God, band. how times have changed. I don't know. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, it, we were really quite surprised by the way it was received. It was received very well. We've done a lot of videos after that, but I still think that's the best one, really. It only costs like a grand or 800 quid or something, and we've done videos later that cost like 20 grand or something, really oh. stupid. Mm. And well, Columbia were paying for those, and it was like... The Is that the flying carpet one? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Why it cost that it amount was of money. The, yeah, yeah, it's high quality stuff. It was a green, blue screen. <laughs> you had to hire a, a baker in as well, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> the chef. Oh, you well, exactly, this is what I'm saying. Those cheesy videos we did later, there was a reason for doing the Midnight Mountain video, and that was we didn't like the situation we were in. It was almost like, <laughs> fuck off, I've got, company. I've, got, I've got a script for that somewhere. <laughs> well, a script? That a script? Yeah, I don't know, Midnight Mountain script somewhere. <laughs> yeah, a script. <laughs> But anyway, going back to the point, <laughs> Ebony Tears video is better than any of those and it only cost a grand. Uh, I think we were just more focused on what we were doing then. Russell's in it as well. Russell and Nicky, my girlfriend. I can just remember these hands. <laughs> yeah. That's Russell and uh, Nicky. Their hands joined you, together. You just wanted to break that union. I was like, <laughs> 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 How dare you be in love? <laughs> Close-up of hairy chins. <laughs> Lots of close-up of hairy chins. And it wasn't blue screen, but we put all those effects on it. Uh, mm. My best bit of that video is when you throw the soil at the uh, oh yeah, at the angel on the gravestone. Yeah. Where was where, would, where did we shoot that? On the road at Lon London Road. Central. Yeah, the, the studio part. Where was that done? I can't remember where that was done. Depot. Where? The depot. It was it? Quite the Belgrade Theatre. Oh, right, okay. I can remember it was. Uh, Doom will be doomed. Don't, don't form a band. <laughs>